cultures will begin to clash as we enter the European age of exploration. We begin our study of European exploration in, well, Africa, of course. In the 1000s, the region of West Africa was proving to be a world leader in all aspects of education. Professors from Europe, Asia, and across North Africa flocked to West African universities, like the University of Timbuktu, to teach with and learn from great African scholars. Tucked within the protection of some of the world's most powerful kingdoms of the day, these schools became centers of life-changing discoveries. These West African kingdoms dominated trade throughout Africa, Europe, and Asia for well over a millennia, between the years of 300 to 1600. Hey, it's not so difficult to be a major player in intercontinental trade when you've got the goods everybody wants. These West African kingdoms had the gold. You know why people wanted gold. It's so shiny. Sorry. Well, hard to find and rare. Oh, and the other good these kingdoms had was salt. That's right, salt. Salt found in Africa's Sahara Desert. Look, salt may not sound as exciting as gold, but in times when there was no refrigeration, packing meat in salt was the main means of preserving food, you know, keeping food fresh. Think about it. In, say, the 1300s, if you were without salt, you could possibly starve to death. Yeah, all of a sudden salt becomes as valuable, if not more valuable, than gold. Between 300 and 1600, if you want gold, and if you need salt, stop on by West Africa. Oh, and bring the best of what you've got to trade. These West African kingdoms were first Ghana, reaching its most powerful point around the year 1000. Then Mali, arriving at its golden age around 1300. And finally, Songhai, which arrived at its zenith around the year 1500. These three kingdoms grew wealthy beyond belief by controlling the important trade of gold and salt. Ever wonder who the richest person to walk planet Earth was? No, no, not me. And it's not Bill Gates either. It was Mansa Musa the king who ruled the Mali Empire during the 1300s. Mansa Musa was also the great nephew of King Sundiata, also known as the Lion King. You may be slightly familiar with the cartoon version of his life story. Yeah, I don't know it either. Musa was a follower of Islam and a Muslim. He was required to take a religious trip or pilgrimage to the Islamic city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia to pray. On his trip across the Sahara Desert from West Africa to Mecca, he took with him 60,000 attendants, 12,000 servants, each dressed in fine Asian silk, carrying a staff of solid gold. 
a caravan of 100 camels helped transport over two tons of gold. Even the king's dogs wore gold and silver collars. During his pilgrimage, Mansa Musa gave away so much gold to the poor that he devalued gold for the next 25 years. In other words, so many people across the Sahara region had gold as a result of Mansa Musa's generosity that gold wasn't so rare anymore, therefore not as valuable. At the center of it all was Mansa Musa, the richest person in history. Now what does this have to do with European exploration? Well, the powers of Europe couldn't help but notice West Africa's extreme wealth. And yes, you guessed it, just like that jealous neighbor of yours, they wanted a piece of the pie. But in the 12, 13, and 1400s, messing with a place as powerful as these West African kingdoms would result in one thing, a beatdown. European nations set their sights on the gold, spices, and silk of the East Indies, or what we now call Asia. To get to China and the Indies, Europeans had been using what was called the Silk Road for hundreds of years. Wait, I wonder if they called it the Silk Road because they were trading for silk? Probably not. Anyway, traveling the Silk Road by wagon through treacherous European mountains, Asian deserts, fighting off bandits who want to steal your goods, getting through the powerful Ottoman Turk Empire, and attempting to tiptoe past fierce Mongolian warriors. You know the Mongols, I mean, they are the reason China built some wall. I, I can't remember the name of the wall, but I hear it was great. If you made it that far on the Silk Road, you had to trade, and then, you guessed it, head your beat-up wagon back to Europe. In other words, the Silk Road was not the way to become rich and powerful like the kingdoms of Africa. But there was one man, just smart enough, just enough of a risk-taker, just greedy enough to try a new, safer, faster way for Europeans to get to Asia and trade. This man had heard that in those West African universities I was telling you about, he heard an idea was being floated around, a new theory, that the Earth was a sphere, spe sphere, that the Earth was round. And if these African scholars were correct, you should be able to sail west of Europe and around the world, ending up east of Europe, right smack dab in Asia. A western sea route to Asia would be much faster. This was one of the original get-rich-quick schemes. Who was this man? In Italy, he was known as Cristoforo Colombo. In Spain, he was Cristobal Colón, but you may know him as Christopher Columbus. And he was praying those African mathematicians, scientists, and scholars were right. The trouble was, most of Europe wasn't so sure, and definitely most European powers were not keen on giving Columbus money, ships, and men. I mean, that seemed too much like throwing money away uh, and over the edge of the earth. Lucky for Columbus. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain decided to take the chance. Well, it wasn't exactly their lives that could possibly plunge off the side of planet Earth. Spain gave Columbus three ships, some money for supplies, and left the recruitment of his crew up to Columbus. Now just where would Columbus find a group of men daring enough, cunning enough, adventurous enough 
to take a voyage into the unknown? That's right, prison. Men found guilty of crimes from burglary to murder walked out of their cells and on to Columbus's ships. Oh, and there were some soldiers too, fresh off of fields of battle. So off went Columbus with his crew of adventurers, uh, I guess, off to find that western sea route to Asia. And as the story goes, a crew member named Rodrigo spotted land on the morning of October 12th, 1492. Except it wasn't Asia, but don't tell Columbus that. He had imagined the world to be a much smaller place, like without the two continents he just accidentally bumped into. He was actually somewhere on a Caribbean island near North and South America, Believing he had made it around the earth to the Indies, Columbus called the people he met there Indians. Oops. Hey, no way that name will stick around for the next 500 years. Speaking of the people Columbus met, here's what he wrote about them in his journal. They brought us parrots and balls of cotton and spears and many other things which they exchanged for glass beads and hawks bells. They willingly traded everything they owned. They do not bear arms and do not know of them, for I showed them a sword and they took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They have no iron. Their spears are made of cane they would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. Columbus was on a mission for resources and none more precious than gold. But he really didn't see much gold. Like maybe someone had a gold earring, but nothing that would make a nation wealthy like those West African kingdoms, that's for sure. But that didn't stop Columbus from writing this letter to the king and queen of Spain. He said, Hispaniola is a miracle. Mountains and hills, plains and pastures are both fertile and beautiful. The harbors are unbelievably good and there are many wide rivers of which the majority of them contain gold. There are many spices and great mines of gold and other metals. Not only did these half-truths, falsehoods, okay, outright lies, earn Columbus a second trip with more men and ships, but he also received an added bonus. You see, the king and queen of Spain offered an extra yearly bonus for the first person on Columbus's voyage to spot land. Step right up, Rodrigo, and get paid. But before Rodrigo could claim his reward, Columbus said that, in fact, he had already caught sight of land glimmering in the moonlight the night before. Columbus, therefore, took the annual reward money for himself exactly what I was thinking. Absolutely no prexy pride going on there. Columbus's stories made their way around Europe in no time flat. Hundreds of explorers were lining up all over Europe, all wanting to strike it rich for their countries and themselves. Thus, beginning Europe's age of exploration, an age that would last for more than 200 years and changed the course of world history forever. <laughs>